Okay, here's our last PowerPoint, last nightly quiz, uh, and the last piece to the puzzle, SIG X. Um, very important. I think you'll find that, like so many things, at first glance, it might seem a little confusing. The more you engage, the more you work with it, the easier it gets. I know for some of you, things haven't gotten easier. But as you'll see, at the end of the day, this is just supply and demand. And so from that perspective, I think you uh, should be able to grasp this for the most part. So let's look at exports and imports. Few transactions, for example. U.S. is selling cars to Mexico. Mexico is buying tractors from Canada. Canada is selling maple syrup to the United States. Japan is buying tequila from Mexico, right? What do all these transactions have in common? They're involving countries that have different currencies, right? And each country wants their own currency. Japan does not want pesos. They want yen. And so in order to make this happen, each country must get the currency of the other country. And so the buyer, the person importing the goods must exchange their currency for the currency of the seller or the exporter. And this is happening all over the world, all the time, between countries. They're exchanging currencies so they can trade with each other. Now, let's look at exchange rates and how we talk about these. Right In the foreign exchange market, we only look at two countries or two currencies at a time. The reality is the U.S. dollar is being compared to the peso, the euro, the yen, the baht, the won, you name it, okay? Just because we're strong against one currency doesn't necessarily mean we'll be strong against another currency, right? So we're only looking at two currencies at a time. But understand this is happening all over the place. And so we examine the price of one currency in terms of the other currency. Three dollars is two euros, Right? Everything we do with currency exchange is in relation to the country or the currency we're talking about. So how do we figure out the, the exchange rate? Well, it depends on which currency we're converting. If we're talking about the dollar and we want to know how many euros one dollar is worth, we take two euros, divide it by three, and we say one dollar equals 66 cents. Right? So it takes... Um, you know, one dollar will get you 66 cents of euros. And if we're doing this the opposite way, one euro in terms of dollars, we divide three by two, and one euro will get us one and a half dollars or a dollar fifty cents. Okay, we're going we're gonna to do something like this, and I think you'll see that, uh, again, the more you work with it, it becomes easier to understand. Now, let's take a look at supply and demand. As I said, all this is is basic supply and demand, okay? So, the foreign exchange market, you need to think. When we go to Japan to buy something, we're not exchanging currency in Japan, okay? Imagine, you know, I like to describe it as this mythical marketplace, this big, beautiful-looking bank in the middle of the ocean, one in the Atlantic and one in the Pacific. They're tied together. This is our foreign exchange market, okay? This is where everyone goes, to these two places to exchange currencies. We're not going to Japan. Mexico is not coming here, okay? This is happening at this mythical market. This is what's known as the foreign exchange market, okay? And what happens is, is when you go to a market, when you go buy a shirt, or you buy a TV, or you buy a beer, or you buy a, well, you don't buy beers, when you buy a dinner, you don't get it for free. You have to provide something. And the same thing happens with currency, right? If I'm buying yen, I demand their currency. If I'm buying something from Japan, I need yen. I demand yen. Well, how do I get yen? I must supply my currency. And so I supply the dollar, okay? So let's take a look at an example here, and I'll show you how this works. So here's a transaction between Mexico, or sorry, between United States and Europe. Okay, um, you don't always have to draw both graphs. I'm showing you both graphs here because I think it's easier to visualize. Okay, so on the left we have the dollars. The horizontal axis is quantity of dollars. 
the vertical axis is euro per dollar, euro over dollar. How do you know the label? The easy way is whatever is down here, we have dollars, goes in the bottom on the vertical axis. So it's euro per dollar. Over here, we have quantity of euros. And over here, we have dollar per euro. Now, one thing I also want you to take notice of. You'll notice that in one graph, um, the demand curve is blue. and the other graph, the demand curve is orange, right? And so the reason for the demand curve being blue and the supply curve being blue is because demand and supply move at the same time. If you're moving the demand in one graph, you're going to move the supply in the other graph. If you're moving the supply in one graph, you're going to move the demand in the other graph. So this is an example that I think most of you can understand. I think many of you have uh, been to another country, uh, whether it's Mexico, South America, Europe, Canada, doesn't matter. If Europeans are coming to vacation in the United States, what do they need? They need dollars, okay? And so what is going to happen is the demand for dollars is going to increase, okay? Well, how do they demand dollars? What did I say they needed to do? Well, they needed to supply euros. And so they supply euros. You'll notice that the price of the dollar is going up and the price of the euro is going down. This is always going to happen. One currency is going to appreciate, the dollar is appreciating, while the other currency is going to depreciate. Again, they're always in relation to each other, right? Simple supply and demand. An increase in the demand for dollars will cause them to appreciate, and an increase in the supply of euros will cause them to depreciate, okay? And again, we will do many, many examples of this and once you work your way through it, I think you'll, you know, you'll see, okay, you got this, all right? So now, let's look at what determines exchange rates. Well, our monkey over there, he looks a little bit drunk. Maybe he's a little bit tipsy. That should give you a hint. We have tastes and preferences, interest rates relative to each other, price level, relative to each country, speculation, and income level, relative income levels. Look at that. It spells out tipsy. What a great coincidence that we have a tipsy chimpanzee. It's amazing how that works out. So let's talk about each of these. Tastes and preferences. As we did in the last example, Europeans have a preference to come to the United States. People in the U.S. want to buy Italian wine, right? So we would demand their currency. We want cheap goods from China. So if we want goods from another country because we prefer them or we have a taste for them, that's going to influence whether or not we want that country's currency. Interest rates. If interest rates rise in the United States relative to the Eurozone, if people can get a higher return on their money, if the interest rate in Europe is 3% and interest rates in the United States are 6%, where are people going to want to put their money? Not to buy, but to get a return on their investment. They're going to want to put their money in the United States. And so Europeans are going to demand our dollar and they're going to supply their dollar, right? So interest rates are the second determinant. Next, relative price levels. This should be one that's easy for you to understand. If prices are higher in Japan, Japanese people are going to want to shift away and buy our products because ours are cheaper relative to Japan's. How does Japan buy our products? They demand our currency, okay? And we are going to buy less from Japan as well. Speculation. If I think the peso is going to appreciate, I'm going to want to buy as many pesos as I can. So I'm going to demand the peso. If I think the euro is going to appreciate, I'm going to buy that currency. So I'm going to demand it. So speculation. This is probably the one that we'll talk about least, but you need, I needed to spell tipsy, and so I needed the S, so I just threw speculation in there. And then we have relative income levels. I put Y because Y is our abbreviation for GDP. As GDP increases, incomes increase as well. Right? If incomes in the United States rise, 
relative to Brazil, we're going to buy not only more products in America, we're going to buy more products from Brazil, we're going to demand Brazilian, Brazilian currency, and we are going to demand uh, their currency, and we're going to supply our currency. And so those are your five determinants for um, the supply and demand for currencies, tipsy, okay? So let's take a look. What will happen to the international value of the peso if there's high inflation in Mexico? Think about it. Prices are high in Mexico. Are people going to want to buy stuff from Mexico? No. They're not going to want to buy, buy, purchase, buy higher price products from Mexico. So we're going to demand less pesos. And Mexico is going to supply more of their pesos because they're going to look for cheaper products around the world. How does this look on our graph? The demand for pesos is going to decrease. The supply of pesos is going to increase. And that is going to cause the peso to depreciate. Okay. Generally, we're not going to look at double shifts like this, but um, just give you an idea of how this might work, right? We could do one or the other, maybe do both, but generally we just look at one or the other. All right, so let's look. This is the, the end. There's a couple different ways of determining exchange rates. The first is a fixed exchange rate. This is where the government can manipulate their exchange rate. They can keep it at a certain level. So if the rate gets too high, they can put more... Uh, sell more of their currency or buy more of their currency in order to keep their exchange rate fixed at a fixed rate. What we've just been talking about is a floating exchange rate. This is an exchange rate that's determined by the fluctuations of supply and demand. Okay. Now, you've heard, maybe you haven't, but there's been a lot of talk about um, governments. People talk about China. People. Trump talks about China. I think Bernie Sanders has mentioned it, that they try to keep their currency um, artificially low, okay? And what this does is if their currency is low, it makes their exports look relatively cheaper. What happens? Why do people not like currency manipulation? Well, let's look at this graphic down here. If country X weakens their currency, that makes the dollar more expensive. That means it's more expensive to buy U.S. products, Right, And so less products are going to come into America, or sorry, we're going to be sending less of our products out. People are not going to want to buy our products. This hurts industries and this hurts jobs. And so this is one of the reasons why currency manipulation, if it goes on, people, you know, there's you know, debate on whether or not it happens, but currency manipulation can cost jobs in the home country. Okay, that's it ask questions tomorrow, and we'll work on this for the rest of the week and test next week.